hypertension with difficult sorry managing patients with difficult to control hypertension it is going to be presented by dr suhail khan he is the ceo arya medical complex which is an upcoming tertiary care hospital in quetta he is also consultant interventional cardiologist of cardiology in national institute of cvd cardiovascular disease karachi Dr. Suhail Khan is Chairman NCVH Salt Lake City, Director American Heart and Vascular Institute, Salt Lake City, Utah, America. Sir, please join us. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Um, Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine, uh, thank you so much for this kind invitation. It is indeed an honor. Um, today we'll talk about managing patients with difficult to control hypertension. I have no financial disclosures. So if I look around here, I see um, for the most part a lot of South Asians here. And the one thing that we share among us is our, our, our passion for carbohydrate rich food, cricket, music, um, and a lot of things. And the one more thing that we do share, which uh, uh, I won't say it's it's a, it's just a nice nice thing to have, but we made the cover letter for American College of Cardiology. Just being a South Asian now is considered as, as a high risk factor for CAD or heart disease. And there are about 40% higher chance of mortality from heart attack in patients uh, who have South uh, Asian ancestry. And uh, by WHO report, about uh, by 2020, South Asians will comprise 25% of the world's population, but will suffer 50% of the world's cardiovascular deaths. South Asian develop coronary artery disease up to uh, 10 years earlier than the general populations. And if you look at, at, at Pakistan, uh, again, if, if you look at the overall uh, patients who have hypertension, which is the leading cause of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, of 1.3, 1.4 billion people who has uh, hypertension in the world, about 60, 70% of them are into low to middle income countries, and Pakistan is one of them. And in Pakistan, 80% of adults and 33% of adults over age 45 and above are hypertensive. And, and again, of all the complications uh, from hypertension, uh, the worst is mortality, and, and most of that mortality is about 45% is due to heart disease and 51% is due to stroke. So there are many things that we can do uh, how to prevent heart disease, but hypertension is one of those low-hanging fruit that, you know, if we are careful enough, that is something that we can easily manage. But despite of all the data which is out there, all the medications uh, that we have, uh, despite of that, there are only 12.5% of the population uh, for hypertension is adequately controlled. Again, there are factors to it. So what I will do is that I would... Um, first talk about what are the causes or the main causes for patients uh, that, uh, whose hypertension cannot be controlled well, and then we'll talk about resistant hypertension, and then we'll also touch upon certain guidelines. So again, going back to the basics, uh, how do we classify hypertension uh, based on uh, international society of hypertension? The optimal blood pressure should be less than 130 by 85, and grade one hypertension starts at 140 millimeter of mercury systolic and above. And this is in contrast to American College of uh, Cardiology, ACC guideline, which is a little more conservative when it comes to hypertension, and they call the stage one hypertension if it is more than 130. Um, then hypertension diagnosis also depends where you measure it. Uh, if it is office-based, uh, uh, it should be more than 140 systolic, more than 90 diastolic. The ambulatory blood pressure, which is, in my opinion, or there is some data out there which is more predictive of uh, end uh, organ damage as well as mortality, the average daytime should be more than 135 uh, systolic, diastolic, more, uh, more than 85. Going ba back to the basics again, and a lot of time when we say that, you know, why this patient is very like, resistant to hypertension, are we measuring it correctly? Uh, most of the time, we are not. Uh, again, ideally, this, uh, the patient, when we are measuring blood pressure, should be rested uh, with the, some back support. There's no talking. There's the, the patient should not have had any coffee or alcohol uh, within the last 30 minutes, should have empty bladder, and should have been rested for three to five minutes before you measure it. I mean, how often we do that? I mean, I would say 99.9% .9 we don't. So this could be one of the reasons that you may not get some good readings or if someone is using the, the, the blood pressure cuff and the size is smaller compared to the arm's circumference, uh, it can overestimate the blood pressure measurement. 
Going back to the medications as well, again, uh, we all know uh, there are other causes of non-adherence non or excessive salt intake or inactivity, but one of the things that I've noticed is a lot of patients, um, the doctors, when they, when they see their patient, they start their, uh, their patients on a single uh, agent. And there is a data that it is in, in, inadequate in 40 to 60 percent of the patient, and in majority, two or more antihypertensive are required, unless if someone is uh, older, age more than 80. Uh, in those cases, in a grade one at low risk, you might start um, a, a single therapy. So uh, again, no, no, more, no monotherapy has been shown to achieve target blood pressure uh, in more than 20 to, 20 to 30 percent of the cases. Combination is better than monotherapy. Again, it is, it is very effective. It can improve the response rate up to 75 to 90 percent. So again, this is not uh, me saying all that. So let's look at the, the guidelines, what the guidelines are saying. So uh, if, once you see the patients uh, where it is established, you have taken the blood pressure measurement very well, you have like repeated it in, in the office a couple of times, now it is labeled as diagnosed. So the drug treatment threshold, uh, you know, if, if they have blood pressure more than systolic 140, the, 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 the target blood pressure in those patients, if, if it is less than 65, should be less than 130 systolic. If it is more than 65, it should be less than 140. Uh, per ESC uh, guidelines, uh, is it, it does recommend uh, two drug combination therapy from the get-go, and in those patients who you cannot control, we can also talk about the triple regimen. So basically, if you have uncomplicated hypertension, the initial therapy should be a combination, either ACE or ARP plus calcium channel blocker or diuretic. Uh, again, if someone is pregnant, uh, you should avoid ACE inhibitor. Uh, we can look at other combinations, and then uh, if even then, if you cannot control the blood pressure, then you can add some diuretic. And the resistant hypertension that I will talk about later, you, we can add uh, you know, spirolectone and uh, some of other medications as well. And again, at any point, if someone has coronary artery disease or angina or congestive heart failure, we can add beta blockers as well. Again, it goes, it's the same uh, reputation that we just talked about. If someone has CAD, then uh, the beta blocker should be on top of the list uh, in combination with some other drugs. Again, someone with CKD, we should start off with ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blocker. Again, um, if uh, we have to use diuretics, we should look at using loop diuretic. ACC guideline also recommend combination therapy in stage two hypertension. This combination is very readily available in Pakistan, which is amlodipine, valsartan, and hydrochlorothiazide. And again, the single uh, dose combination therapy is preferred in patients who are difficult to control. And it has consistently shown to reduce blood pressure. And even if you look at many other dual combinations, this a triple combination works very well in reducing mean systolic blood pressure as well as mean diastolic blood pressure. And they're also complementary. For example, if the ARP can lead to hyperkalemia, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, you know, uh, counteracted or uh, neutralized by diuretics. And if RAS blockers uh, may attenuate uh, the edema that is caused by calcium channel blockers. So let's briefly talk about resistant uh, hypertension. Um, uh, per GNC, the blood pressure, if someone has blood pressure more than 140, despite on uh, three drugs, including diuretics, uh, is labeled as resistant hypertension, or AHA is uncontrolled blood pressure despite three drug, or blood pressure controlled but require at least four drug, or it's called controlled resistant hypertension. The actual prevalence, uh, again, in the U.S., I don't have data for Pakistan, but I, but I do expect it to be higher than this. It estimates around 8 to 9%. Um, and the Kaiser Permanente, uh, it, it, the, the estimate is, again, 1.9%. And these numbers tend to underestimate, just like when we look at uh, the cardiovascular risk score for South Asian, uh, whatever we use in the U.S., it does underestimate it for South Asians. Uh, Again, it is associated with increased uh, cardiovascular morbidity as well as mortality. So 50% of uncontrolled blood pressure is due to pseudo-resistant. Again, that's why I was trying to emphasize on accurate blood pressure measurement is, is improper blood pressure uh, BP measurement, and that is some basics that we all need to focus on. These patients also can have white coat, uh, white coat effect, and in those patients, we can use ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And also poor compliance in approximately 30% of the patient. And in, in, in my experience, I've been at NICVD for the last eight months after spending 18 years in the U.S., and Dr. Tahir Sakhir will also attest to it, the non-compliance is pretty higher. 
And again, uh, it is one of those centers that we see about 40 heart attacks a day, and I've never seen that in my life. So again, this is, this is a major deal here. The true resistant hypertension comprise about 50% of, of, of the population. I mean, these are run-of-the-mill cause that we all know is due to excess uh, sodium intake, inadequate diuretic therapy, medication, dose or side effects, excessive alcohol intake, and secondary causes of, of hypertension. There are medication, if someone, side effects, uh, for example, if someone is on NSAID COX-2 inhibitors, uh, oral contraceptives, uh, sympathomimetics, like decongestant, diet pills, uh, cocaine, stimulants, amphetamines, um, alcohol intake, antidepressants, erythropoietin, cyclosporin, and herbal compounds. So again, before we label someone as, as someone is having resistant hypertension, we have to rule all this out. Um, uh, in these patients, again, it's challenging. I mean, lifestyle modification and exercise, I mean, it does decrease the, you know, some, but it's, it's, it's not uh, as, as effective. Um, the things that we can do differently, I mean, uh, those guidelines that we talked about using different combination, uh, we should uh, maximize or optimize diuretics. Uh, chlorthaladon is two times as potent as HCTZ, so that is something that we should be using more often in these patients. Again, uh, not every combination is, is uh, you know, created the same. Some are uh, better than the others. For example, ACE, and, uh, ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers are superior to ACE inhibitors and thiazide di diuretic. And control blood pressure, ARB and calcium channel blocker, uh, it, it does control blood pressure in about 60% of individuals on prior three drug regimen, including a diuretic. And uh, the third line is after you maximize with the dual agents then, uh, or uh, triple therapy, you can add, uh, you know, spironolactone lecton uh, or epilirinone. Um, uh, in, you have to make sure that the patients uh, have GFR more than 30. Uh, it can lead to hyperkalemia, uh, so we should avoid this drug in someone with uh, potassium of more than 4.5, and it does lead to breast tenderness and gynecomastia that we need to be careful uh, about. Again, it, it has a there is a data out there which has shown its efficacy. Uh, again, going back to the same thing, once we do all those four drug therapy, including, uh, you know, uh, aspirin lecton, um, even then if we cannot control the blood pressure, then we can think about adding labetalol, or we can uh, uh, think about uh, using centrally acting alpha-2 agonists, like, uh, either, for example, clonidine. In the U.S., we used to have patches of chlorodine. I don't know if we have that available in Pakistan. And then vasodilator like combination of minoxidil plus loop diuretics. Um, most importantly, we, we have to rule out secondary causes of hypertension. Um, and, and of that, the one that I see very often in Pakistan is obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, there is a obesity pandemic, and the one thing uh, that Dr. Ali just asked all you, you guys about, you know, sleep patterns, and that is something that I always ask my patients. Um, patient with obstructive sleep apnea can increase the risk of uh, hypertension, diabetes, congestive heart failure, and even these patients, if they lose 20 to 30 pounds, and uh, you will see uh, that it is much easier to control their, you know, blood pressure. So that is something we should always screen up. Uh, screen our uh, patients. And then we, also, uh, we should also look at primary hyperaldosteronism as well as renal artery stenosis. Uh, if someone is on three drugs, including diuretic, if it is a male more than 50, and it's always a good idea to get a renal Doppler ultrasound to rule out a renal artery stenosis. Or if it is a female, uh, in, in those patients uh, too, they may have fibromuscular dysplasia and uh, the, the renal vascular diseases uh, Needs to, needs to be ruled out. So in summary, hypertension is, is a major cause of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, and when treating hypertension, consider combination therapy at the outset, and also think about SDC therapy or a single dose combination therapy. Uh, rule out uh, sleep apnea and other secondary causes for difficult to treat hypertension. And in continuation of this talk, we will be hosting this webinar, uh, which is a South Asian uh, and heart disease. Is this a new pandemic? Uh, this will uh, be hosted online on uh, May 10th, and we will have speakers uh, from India, Bangladesh, as well as in the U.S. Um, it will be a 90 minutes, so all of you are welcome to join us. Thank you very much.